a very good evening morning and afternoon to all of you who have joined us today first of all thank you for joining in and being the true pro veterans and showing up every saturday relentlessly and thank you so much for that so in all of these workshops that we have been conducted we have been conducting about a year now uh, we talk about different design disciplines design skills tools and what not but this workshop is a special one since it teaches us uh, teaches us the underlying goal behind everything that we have learned so far how to land a job and how to get hired by the company you desire because the design skills you have are very different from the other hireable skills that you would want to attain to get that job we have pushti with us to help you learn about it and pushti is current is currently working as a senior product designer and leading user experience at scaler she dropped out of engineering yes i think most of the engineers are pursuing design now and she is another example to pursue her passion for design highly interested in building new products for users which ease their lifestyles and fill their bar of satisfaction <clears throat> sorry she likes traveling and meeting new people which also helps expand her horizon in understanding human behavior pushti the stage is all yours a very warm welcome and thank you for joining in with us today Hi! Thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me as well. And thanks to all the attendees for being here on a Saturday eve. Ah, uh, and yeah, let's uh, stick till the end, and I'll try to wrap it up as soon and as fast as possible so that you can enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> and uh, okay, so I'll start with the structure. Ah, uh, I, I like they've already introduced uh, me to you, so I'll start sharing my screen. I'll jump into it. you can post your questions in the chat box and we'll take up the questions at the end um okay everyone so yeah we'll be covering about uh, everything about hiring how it goes in the interviews what are the processes what are the steps and since i have been actively hiring for my team i can share some of my experiences as well so yeah stay tuned and let's get started so i think uh, they've already covered my introduction but yeah just to brief again uh, i am an engineering dropped out and then i joined nif to pursue design and then um it's almost been 3 years i've been working in the industry and currently i'm working with scaler as a senior product designer so today we'll be covering uh these five topics uh if you are if you are a designer if you are transitioning from graphic design and if you want to transition to product design i'll tell you the differences i'll tell you how to do it because i'm coming from the same background i had gd in my initial years of my career i have practiced it a lot and then later on i've uh, switched to product design so i'll share my experiences around it uh then i'll be also talking about how to shortlist your companies i mean even before uh, the interviews the first step is to shortlist your companies you should know you should be well aware about where are you applying it should not be at random at all so i'll be telling you how to what are the different type of companies and how to shortlist it uh then next we'll be covering everything about resumes how to build your resumes what are the best um uh, steps to uh, like approach uh while you are building your resume and uh, what what are the content or what are the things that you should add in your resume what are the things that you should not add in your resume everything about it then we'll be also covering about post portfolios and case studies this is one of the most common topics that i have been mentoring students on um how to build like perfect portfolios uh, nothing is perfect this thing is never ending uh and uh, but i have some of my experiences which i can share around case studies and what we do around evaluation so yes and then how do you finally is the interviews i'll be uh, discussing about the steps the tips and tricks and how do you approach it everything in detail so yeah let's get started okay so first let's cover the difference between graphic design and product design i guess you a lot of must be aware about it but i'll uh, simply like uh, brief it about from an industry point of view so graphic design involves a lot of visual elements while on the product side it's more on the interaction and building products so for example i'll i'll take an example and then i'll go forward with it so for example if you're building any product any digital product for example an app let's say it's a mental health app so designing the whole experience of how the user will use it how the user will approach that app how the user will actually be able to interact with that app 
it will all be a part of product design but let's say all let's say if you have to market that app into the market if you have to reach out to the users you have to build out awareness about the app so you'll make some posters you'll make some social media posts around it so everything around it falls into graphic design so this is a very a uh, broad example that I've shared, but like uh, it will be easier for you to uh, understand through this example. Graphic design is more towards brand, as I mentioned. So if when you have to pitch out your brand, we use a lot of graphic design skills, but product design and UX design is more towards user. So while actually building any product, you have to think a lot about your user. How will they respond to any of your product or any of your feature or anything that you're building on? While in graphic designing, you have to be more towards brand centric that how will your design, how will your creative basically portray the brand. So it has always, uh, it always needs to follow the brand guidelines. It has always uh, to be in that particular bucket, while on the product side, it has always to be for the user. Uh, on the graphic designing front, it's more creative, it's more artistic, like if you are more of an artistic person, you have an open playground to go over here, uh, though some uh, companies would have their own brand guidelines, which you might need to follow, but still it's more of artistic and less functional, I would say, not saying that it's completely non-functional, but less functional, while on the product side. It's totally functional and it's very logical and practical. It doesn't matter that uh, how beautify or like how uh, visually appealing you create a product until and unless it's not usable. So you need to think of usability as well in the product and UX. So uh, graphic design is more of a specialized role that you only uh, need to work towards building posters, building graphics around it. While in product design, you might have to do end-to-end -end things like building strategies, building, uh, doing the ideation of the product, building wireframes, conducting research and everything around it. So it is like a multidisciplinary role. You might need to do a lot, uh, like some of the graphic design work also in product design. Uh, for example, if you're joining a startup, so there's just one person who's handling a lot of things. I'll be covering that in the uh, later slides. Uh, graphic design involves a lot of typography, color theory. So you, you need to be well versed of all of these things, though these things are also required in product design. But again, it's a mandate in graphic design. In product design, uh, like if you're designing a product uh, for a company, they might have their set brand guidelines. So they might have their color typography, everything sorted. So and uh, in the product side, you need to pay more attention and uh, basically pay more uh, like emphasis on the empathy, like understanding where the user is coming from, understand the whole persona, conducting research about it, wireframing the total thing, and uh, like creating prototypes out of it, again, testing it with the users and creating all of those things. Um, on the graphic design side, this is just uh, for uh, like, uh, I guess you must all be aware about it, but just to conclude. So on the graphic design side, uh, we use multiple softwares like Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator. Uh, if it's a photo heavy work, we use Photoshop. It's, if it is a vector heavy work, we use Illustrator. And now Procreate is also like in the game. So it's very easy to use and very, very convenient. Uh, on the product design side, we use more of Figma since it's a prototyping software and a lot of PMs are also using now Figma uh, for uh, collaboration with the teams uh, for documentation as well. Um, Envision, Adobe XD and Sketch, uh, again, for prototyping and creating wireframes. So yeah, this was all about graphic design and product design uh, in general. Um, if you are a graphic designer who is planning to move to product design, or let's say if you are someone who is not from a design background, but you want to switch to product or UI UX, then uh, like there are three things that you would need. Uh, though it just sounds like three, but these are a lot and these are everything that you need to transition into this field. One is the skill set that is definitely the most required for uh, product design or UI UX design. Um, empathy. So something like if you can relate to other people, if you can actually like be in their shoes, try to feel what they're feeling, that that is something um, this skill, uh, I mean, this field requires the most. Then again, the observation. So if you're not very observant, then you might miss out on a lot of things. Let's say if you're not able to identify a person's habit, let's say if you are uh, kept with a person for 24 hours, if, if you're not able to observe how do they react to a particular thing or how do they converse or anything, um, that means you lack observation skills over there. So again, you might not be able to build out great solutions for it if you're not observing the uh, problems basically. Then great communication. So this comes when you have to actually conduct user researches. Um, 
when you, when we actually carry out user researches it's very important that we actually make the other person very comfortable so again this is one of the most uh, important skill set to have and then critical thinking like if you are given a problem how do you approach it how do you go about it uh, are you able to think of the problems even or not so this is something uh, like the overall there are a lot of other things also in the skill set but these are the most common things that a recruiter would look out for if if they are hiring for a product designer uh, then project and case studies. I know this is, um, I mean, uh, this is, this is an entry point. So you would definitely need it. Like, even if you have great skill set, but if, if you're a fresher, then if you're applying to companies, they would need to see some of your work. I mean, they just can't go through your resume. They can't go, they can't read your skill set and uh, understand, okay, you possess these skill set. You need to prove it. You need to put it out. And so that the other person reviewing your profile can go through it and can make it out that, yeah, this person has the skill set. So that is another thing. It might not be required when you move to senior roles, like uh, like very, very senior roles, once you have like five to six or like six, seven years of experience or later. But in the initial um, stages, it is required and it is a mandate. Uh, coming to the next is the problem solving mindset. So I would use the term here, actually the Jugadu mindset. Uh, it should not be always very, very detailed, logical. Sometimes you need to think of Jugars as well. So the faster you are able to think of Jugars and, uh, uh, and the faster you are able to think of solutions, the better it is. So this is something that we actually look out for. Uh, moving on, uh, like how to shortlist your dream companies. So uh, before starting, um, actually I would want to understand from you all what is your dream company so uh post it out in the uh chat i'll just quickly go through it Uh, okay, so we have been getting some responses, Google, Microsoft, Growth School, SaaS-based companies, Instagram, Accenture, Google, Cred, uh, Himanshu says is a company who takes US designers seriously. I mean, UX mature company, that's a very good approach. Uh, Pinterest, try it. Uh, okay, so we have a lot of responses. Uh, moving on, I would want to know what, like if you if you are aware about what are the two different type of companies available in the market, in the industry, basically. Uh, someone mentioned SaaS, so SaaS-based companies. So are you aware about the two kind of buckets that are available in the market? Yes, uh, I think a lot of people are able to uh, mention it, product-based and uh, service-based. Uh, Priyanshu also mentioned B2B and B2C. Yes, uh, Priyanshu, that is also correct. But uh, the major bucket that is there is the product-based and the service-based. Um, I'll be covering like what of these companies actually mean and uh, how can you uh, actually select what is good uh, fit for you. So service-based companies are the ones who provide services to other companies. So for example, if I'm if I'm owning a company, I'll have other clients for whom I'll be working on. I'll be, maybe they have their own products and I'll be providing UX services or maybe product services to them or any design services. So that is a service company. Whereas on the, uh, like if, uh, myself, I, I start as an entrepreneur. If I thought of an idea, I build a product on my own. Uh, that would be a product company. I'll be sourcing. Uh, I'll be uh, like sharing my product to the market directly. So th this is the major difference between the service company and the product companies. Uh, both of these companies are actually like hire actively for designers uh, all over the world, uh, not just India, but all over the world. Uh, so a uh, service company just uh, basically actually they have their own clients, and the product company. Uh, the owner is the basically the sole uh, stakeholder and they decide everything on their own. So I'll uh, discuss both pros and cons of service companies and product companies. So while working in a service company, uh, you actually work on a surface level. So for example, you got a project, uh, you might like control it for, uh, let's say six months, seven months, a year, uh, two years, and then it would be basically shared with the other team. You won't have the ownership of that particular product that you're creating. Ultimately, it would be transferred. You are hired on a temporary basis just to uh, fulfill uh, the requirement for that particular time. So you won't be the core owner of the product 
basically you are creating so you work on a very surface level uh, a lot of research and everything is done by the other party basically the client who is there and then uh, once basically they are done with the research and everything they send you the analysis and then you create on uh, create solutions on the basis of it so that is how service company works so for example if i'm a designer in a service company i might get a chance to work on multiple products so for example i have a different clients in health tech fintech edtech so i might get to work on all of these three clients so i would have a very expanded horizon of understanding multiple industries multiple sectors as a whole uh, but in product companies, for example, if I'm working in a tech company, then uh, basically I'll be just limited to that particular uh, sector or the industry I would be working on. Uh, on the product company, you work on a product in depth and in detail. So anything compared to service company, basically you you research about it on your own, you ideate about it on your own and everything. So basically you work on a deeper level in product companies, the horizon is less. I mean, in, in terms of the industry uh, expansion, but it's basically deeper in depth. So yeah, for and uh, just to quote some examples, so service companies, our TCS, Infosys, we have Lollipop in India, F1 and ThoughtWorks. So these are a few service-based companies. Basically, they hold other clients. And some of the product companies, Google, Microsoft, Swiggy, Zomato. So I've covered like uh, two of the uh, MNCs and two of the startups as well. Uh, not covering a lot about startups and MNC. Uh, if you want me to share, let, let me know in the chat. I'll cover at the end. Uh, moving forward, uh, then like coming to the resume. So basically how to design the best resume. Uh, there are multiple steps basically. So if you're sending out your application to a recruiter, uh, then a recruiter might go through your portfolio first or they might go to your resume first. So basically both of them should be in sync because you can't lose out any opportunity to impress the uh, recruiter. So let's get started with this. I'll be starting with the content structure, basically what all you need to add in your resume to make it a very balanced one. Uh, first should be your name. It should be very, very well highlighted and your current title. Uh, you should also have a very small bio of uh, and like uh, which defines basically who you are and what you do. And let's say, for example, if you're transitioning into a new role, for example, if you if you are a graphic designer, if you're seeking employment, if you're seeking out for roles in product design, UX design, or for example, if you're a UX, um, uh, an engineer who is transitioning into product design, then actually you need to mention this in your bio. Because uh, at times when I'm, uh, as a recruiter, if I'm going through a resume, if I see that you don't have a relevant background experience in product design, I might not uh, go forward with it. There are some auto filters as well, where a person, because a lot of companies receive a lot of applications, so they don't filter it manually. They have uh, other filter applications which go through it. So uh, it's better that you mention all of these keywords in your bio uh, so that uh, the other person is aware about what you are seeking out for. Uh, then the experience. So add only what is relevant. For example, if you have been switching roles, if you have already experience in product design and before that you were let's say if you are in engineering background or any commerce background or any any other role don't add a lot of details about it uh like the person doesn't have a lot of time to go through each and everything in detail you can definitely mention that you worked here for xyz months xyz years but uh then in the other uh i mean for the other roles which are relevant there would be lesser emphasis on that uh so clear up the cutter just add only what is relevant uh, next thing is like write in detail about your projects. Don't just mention that, uh, okay, I have done this work. I have done this work. Um, you should mention that, okay, I have done this work in this amount of time. It has currently reached this goal and it has, uh, let's say, uh, it, it was able to uh, contribute to business goals or basically uh, revenue or anything like that by this, this, this person, this was able, I launched this, I worked on this feature. This was launched uh, in like two, three months. And then it was able to grow the business and or uh, basically help the business to grow by X, Y, Z percent. So you should always mention these metrics because the other person gets to know that, uh, yeah, you have worked on things which have created some impact. Another thing which I uh, like, I've seen a lot of uh, people do not do it. So 
uh, like I see a lot of projects which are in the portfolio and they have described all those projects in the resume as well, but they don't connect all of these things. They don't add links. So it's it's really great if you're adding links to all of these projects which are in your portfolio and you're describing in your resume as well. So uh, basically when a person is actually reviewing your resume, they can actually go to that particular project at that point of time and relate to whatever you have written in your resume. So this is one thing that I would emphasize on a bit that you should definitely add uh, links to your project and make the basically the PDF should be interactive. Uh, moving forward, so some of the do's and don'ts of uh, like building the resume. Uh, first is keep the design very, very simple and clean. It should basically align with your own uh, personality. For example, if I'm a very quirky person, my resume should reflect it a bit. If I'm a very minimal, I'm on a very minimal side. If I'm a very simple person, my resume should reflect some of my personality. Uh, for example, if I'm a very minimal person, if I create a resume like this first uh, example that I've put in here, it doesn't match my, uh, my personality. So the person who's evaluating won't be able to connect with me a lot. So this is the first point where the person is actually not on call with you. They just get to connect with you through uh, some physical things. So that is the first point of impression that you can create over there. So it should be always very simple and clean. It should not be complicated. Should, the content should be very skimmable. Um, I'll, uh, and the keywords and everything should be very, very highlighted. Basically, if I'm just glancing through the page, I should get and grasp the gist of all the content that is out there. Moving on. So I've seen a lot of people adding skill set like this. So uh, personally, and uh, like I have also received feedback and I have also discussed with a lot of designers around this particular part. So it is not a very good practice to add uh, ratings to your skill set because it's very subjective. So for example, uh, if I'm rating myself 10 on 10 on graphic design, uh, I feel I'm a pro or let's say 5 on 10 even. So, but for the other person, this, this rating might vary for me as well. Uh, if I'm 10 on 10 for myself, then the other person might not feel the same. They might feel that I'm 8 on 10. So these ratings do not matter. It actually occupies a lot of space uh, also in your resume. So we should totally avoid this particular part. Moving on uh, to your personal details. So phone number, email ID, LinkedIn profile, portfolio, and personal website. These are the few things that you should definitely mention. I have seen a lot, a lot of people do not mention phone number on their um, resumes, which is a very, very bad thing because um, if I am a recruiter, I might want to reach out to you directly on your phone rather than your email ID. So, uh, and uh, that is what HRs do. So HR uh, is the first one who would actually call you and set up your call with the other designers. So that is something you should definitely keep a note on. It should, uh, your phone number should always be functional. If you are an international applicant, if you're applying to other countries, you should also add your WhatsApp number as well, though they would prefer to work on email IDs. But yeah, if you have another WhatsApp number, you should definitely add that since we are in a remote setup and a lot of remote culture is growing up. Um, uh, LinkedIn profile, one, one a very quick tip over here. So a lot of people do not actually alter their uh, LinkedIn profile address. Uh, so LinkedIn provides you an op uh, option to change your URL. So some of the people actually, they just use the same slug that a LinkedIn auto generates. Uh, I would suggest you to go there and create your personalized URL and then add it in your uh, resume. All of these things should also be clickable. If I'm uh, like, if I'm clicking on the LinkedIn icon or your profile link, I should be redirected to your um, LinkedIn profile. So try to create the resume as an interactive pdf um portfolio and your personal website uh add links to both so if you have uh, if you're maintaining a personal website uh add link to that and if you're um or like maintaining a portfolio maybe on behance or some other platform uh, add link to that as well uh coming to the format so keep the file size as low as possible because it takes a lot of time to load uh personally if i'm receiving uh 200 applications a day if i have to add actually go through it of all. If like my screen is just loading, 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 I won't spend a lot of time. I'll just skip it and I'll just go forward because it is taking a lot of time. So keep the file size as low as possible so that it can be attached on mails and it is easily, uh, it could be easily shared over any other platform. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, prefer interactive PDF, uh, which can redirect to your uh, specific uh, projects or specific your uh, LinkedIn profile or your portfolio or your website. 
then there are multiple ways uh, of how you can actually send. You can either attach it in the mail. Uh, in some uh, companies, basically, they ask you to fill a form and upload your resume. Um, I personally feel that providing a Google Drive link is the best option. So in case you have to update your resume, it will be automatically updated. If you're sending, if you're attaching a PDF, then you might not be able to make changes to your uh, resume for example at times what it happens for example if i'm applying in december the uh, the uh, post has already been already been closed so the company won't look at my profile at that point of time but let's say if they start hiring in february again so they might consider my profile again by that time i have done two more projects but they would be viewing my older resume in case of a google drive it will be automatically uh, updated so yeah, this is one method which you can do in order to basically update your portfolio. Moving on how to create a very, very nice portfolio. Um, definition of a perfect portfolio doesn't exist. So, but yeah, there, there are a few things which we can actually keep in mind while working on. So yeah, uh, on an average, actually a recruiter spends less than three minutes on your portfolio, on your own portfolio, not just a case study. And that's the truth because uh, imagine you are a recruiter yourself so and you're receiving almost 100 to 200 applications which you have to review and even if you spend like 5-10 minutes it would be a lot so people generally don't spend a lot of time so in those three minutes basically or in just one minute I would say actually you have to grab the attention of your recruiter on how you can uh, basically you you have to add those elements so whether you are creating a website whether you are putting it out on the hands those first two minutes should be very, very hooking for the person who is actually viewing for you. So how do you do it? Um, how do you make the impact in three minutes for the other person? Consider it as a product. Consider it as a UX exercise itself. Um, so your case study or your portfolio is the product and the person who is actually viewing it or the person who is actually going through it is the user. So now you have to think of that user. How do you hook that user and how do you make them go through your case study or your portfolio so that is the experience that you have to design it should not be like yeah uh, like the other person goes and navigates on their own you have to design the navigation so that the person navigates in that specific way and you have to design your website your portfolios in that particular format so let's move on to what type of portfolios we can actually build so you can have a personal website it could either be hosted on any of the no-code platforms like Wix, Squarespace, etc. Or you can actually uh, code it if you know coding. That is also good. Uh, you can host it on Behance. Uh, you can also try Notion. A lot of people actually have been trying this. It's very easy to use and it's very interactive as well. Uh, some of the other portfolio methods that I have also received and uh, have done it as well. So these are uh, the PDFs and Google Drives. I won't recommend these two at all because uh, again, uh, PDF, you can't change. You can do, you can't do the changes. It's very heavy and it's very like, if you want to showcase two or three projects, it's very, the file gets very heavy and it takes a lot of time to load. In Google Drive, it's not very organized. Like I don't want to uh, go and like click on each of the folders, uh, uh, open each of the PDFs or the images. So it's not a very good experience for the recruiter. It might be easier for the user but it, it takes a lot of toll on uh, basically the recruiter who is actually looking out your, on your profile or your portfolio. So my personal recommendations would always be your personal website, Behance and Notion. Uh, in out of all of these, I would actually prefer Behance because it's very, very easy to use. Uh, it uh, Actually, you can't procrastinate a lot if you have your own personal website you and if you have coded specially you might like have to do all over it again. I mean, if for just to add one thing, you have to do in a lot of efforts. So that is something that uh, uh, that might take a lot of effort and you might procrastinate, which might lead to a lot of delay in your uh, updation of the portfolio. Uh, if you have, if you're using the other tools, for example, uh, Wix or Squarespace, then it's comparatively easier. Another drawback of you having a personal website over Behance is, for example, if I am actually looking out for designers in my team, I would go to Behance and I would search for projects. Uh, I can actually discover people through projects on Behance, which is not possible on the personal website. So in my opinion, uh, as a recommendation, I would prefer if a person has both of these things, 
uh, because it's the discoverability is comparatively easier on Behance. But yeah, a personal website has their own touch. You can actually show your own UX skills over there. Uh, you can create a nice navigation. You can tell more about yourself. That would be a one spot thing for each and everything that you do. So yeah, uh, that's about it. Then let's move on to how to draft your case studies. Um, let's start. So uh, first, I would want to cover like what are the types of case studies so uh, first is the observational so for example you look around yourself and uh, you look out that you look out and uh, for a problem uh, you are going through the road uh, basically the same path every day and you figure out that there is a problem with the door uh, of the park that you are passing by each and every day so you figure out the problem you now you think of what solution can you do or what are the other alternatives that you can actually do to basically enter the park that is something that you observed on your own and then you are trying to figure out the solutions on your own it could be anything it could be any experience uh, that is one type of the case study another is the critique so in that case you basically take any product any existing product or any app or any website or anything and then you start reviewing it and you provide your own solutions on how it can be better the only drawback here is you uh, at times you don't have an understanding of why that particular thing has been done in a certain way for example i'll take uh, an example of amazon's website over here so personally i feel that i can improve the amazon ux or uh, the ui and basically make it more visually appealing to the users there's a lot of clutter uh, i can try to declutter a lot of things i can try to reduce a lot of text and make it, uh, make it more uh, cleaner and visually appealing but i don't know the business aspects of it that why this has been done in a certain manner so until this i don't know about it and if i'm providing my own solutions that might lead to a bad impact on that so uh, try to avoid uh, uh, this kind of case study until and unless you know the backing of it if you know the backing of it and if you're providing uh, solutions for it definitely that's a good thing if you uh, and this can also actually uh, cover feature additions for example if i'm using zoom on a regular basis i i figured out that there should be one solution uh, i mean one feature that can be added uh, uh, i think this has holes but maybe it, we can add just for an example I can create a case study around that that uh, and it would also fall in the critique category that I'm actually taking up one product and I'm criticizing it. I'm actually looking out for better solutions. So that also comes in this. So there are two approaches to go for this particular type of case study. Other one is uh, uh, like define uh, taking up any predefined problem. So there are a lot of uh, problems available on the Internet, like make a travel app, make a pet friendly app or X, Y, Z. So you can take up any of these problems. I'll now go about like what and why and where should we use these type of case studies. So when you are actually drafting an observational case study, it actually shows the recruiter that you are able to pick out problems as well, not just the solutions, but you're also aware about uh, that there is a problem. So this analyzes basically this shows your critical thinking skills. On the critique side, uh, it also shows uh, that uh, you understand the product very well. You are able to understand what a user needs out of it. And then you are basically providing solutions for that. For predefined uh, problems, uh, like uh, it is good if you don't have anything if, uh, and you can't like linger on and procrastinate on that particular part. So it's a good to start with basically. So let's say if I decide to start my portfolio, I don't have any problems around me. I, I'm observing, observing for two weeks, three weeks. It will be like months and months and I don't have any problem right now. So it's better to uh, pick up any predefined problem and then start with it. Uh, best is like if you have one out of each of these case studies in your portfolio so that it reflects basically all of your uh, uh, skill set. So yeah. Uh, coming to how to draft your case study. So your case study should be an experience in itself. Uh, it should be an experience for the person who is actually viewing that case case study they should not scroll up and down like find out for things where okay this person has done this or not have they done the user research have they done the surveys what have they done it it should not be like that you should be navigating the user to basically in a in a sequential manner it should be very seamless experience for the person who is viewing it it should not be like uh, the recruiter only but anyone who is actually reviewing your case study 
uh, it should be narrated in a form of story, not a very, very textual or a very technical manner. So you can actually start with your own experience. So for example, if, you, if it's an observational case study, instead of like just mentioning the problem, so I figured out a problem in this gate or anything like that. So it you can actually start with the whole story, basically how you figured it out, how you approached it, what did you think at that particular time what all thoughts did you encounter with and why did you uh, think to go ahead with this particular problem statement so it should be like a story it should uh, when actually a person is reading the story they get more hooked to a particular thing uh, rather than if they're just reading a textual textual which is not making uh, like sense to them or which they're not, not relating to so if you are uh, narrating a story it basically feels like you are sitting in front of me and you're talking to me so it is like it goes both the ways uh, the next point is start reverse um, at the end products first so whatever is your final product or whatever are your final screens add those screens at the top add a video related to it so that a person is actually aware about what they are going to see or they'll always they'll be able to relate through the whole case study they'll be able to relate that okay you have made this screen and uh, uh, for example you are doing some wireframing or you are making the eye they'll be able to relate that okay uh, you're making this eye at this particular point this this was done in screen in this part so have a very small gist at the top um avoid templates so do not do not follow templates at all i mean uh at a lot of times i can actually figure out it uh, from the portfolio or from the case study that this person has done course from this particular um organization because uh, basically they teach you uh, uh or they uh, they provide you that uh, i mean like a template uh, to i mean how to go about your case study it's not that you have to blindly follow that so something which you can take a reference from but you don't have to blindly follow and in template, there are a lot of design processes. So you don't have to follow all the processes. For example, for any feature, let's say if um, if you're designing any feature for Zoom, there is already the persona is already defined. Everything is already defined. You don't need to define the whole persona again. So a lot of processes would be cut down. So you need to figure out what problem you're working on and what is the process that you need to follow to achieve the solution for that particular problem. You don't have to follow all the UX processes in one particular case study. Uh, this also shows that you are very selective about and uh, what process to choose because uh, when you work in the industry, you have very limited time. So you can't follow all of these things. Uh, let's say if you are given like five days to work on a project, you can't do uh, the user research, user testing, create the personas, everything in just five days. So you have to be very selective and you have to be very smart that uh, what are the resources available? How do you use those resources and how do you move forward with it? So always define your process, mention why you are using that process. Don't use predefined um, frameworks. Uh, you can take a reference from those frameworks, but don't use it as it is because it might not fit into your product. So uh, please define your process, mention why that uh, process was followed because again, uh, it shows that uh, like you have an understanding of the background as well that why you are following it. Then don't just add the final screens. I see a lot of portfolios. They just uh, redesigning of Amazon website. So they just add uh, the final UI. They just clean it. But why it is done? As a recruiter, as a person, if I have to hire you in my team, I don't know your thought process behind it. I would want to know your thought process. So yeah, don't just add the final screens. Add a lot of detailed information on why it is done about it. Um, it also... Uh, depends on which role you're applying. For example, you're applying for a product role, your case study would take a different turn because it would need a lot of business aspects that how you would position into business, um, what are the technicalities that you would want to look out for, all of these things. For example, if you're applying for a UI role, then I would want to see a lot of uh, visual work, but with some background research as well. So for example, if you're using orange color in, in any of the apps, why are you using orange color what is the thought process behind using the orange color if you're using uh rounded edges uh, in the elements why are you using uh, rounded elements what is the thought process behind using it how are you able to relate it with the user psychology so all of these things i would want to know as a recruiter so add a lot of um, background uh back i mean uh, background research to it that why you have added why you have done a certain thing in a particular manner then add a lot of visuals. So if you write a lot of text, I mean, it's a very comprehensive thing to add. But then uh, 
since I mentioned, we just have like three minutes. So, and three minutes to go through the whole portfolio. So for one case study, we won't go through a lot of text. Uh, the better, like, I mean, the more visuals there are, I'll be able to glance. I mean, I'll be able to grab it better because it, like it's a proven theory that you grasp more through visuals. So the more the, the more the visuals, then easier it is to catch the attention of the other person. You can add a lot of gifs, uh, GIFs you can add a lot of motions, you can add a lot of videos. Uh, so I would actually uh, want to see a two minute video of the whole presentation rather than just reading it. Um, that uh, actually varies from person to person, but yeah, it would be uh, hooking and it would be like a new addition to from all the portfolios that I've been uh, viewing. Uh, Last thing that it's okay to make mistakes. It's not like uh, nothing is perfect and nothing is uh, on spot. So even if you felt like you have published a case study, you felt it was not the best solution, go back to the case study, let that solution be there, draft another case study of why you think it could be better and provide that uh, I think it was not the best solution. I have got a better solution. Uh, it, so it's okay to make mistakes and reiterate on it. In fact, it's it shows that you have that... Um, ability to analyze that there could be things uh, that could be done in a better way. So yeah, let's move forward uh, about the content. So add the only relevant content, as I've already mentioned that uh, we should not add a lot of content, uh, which is irrelevant. I mean, you should not follow design processes, like uh, follow all the designs, UX, UX design processes. Um, also add what you have learned. So I would like towards the conclusion, if you have learned any new process or if you have um, gone through any of the articles where you learned something, add that what you learned through this particular exercise. Add about uh, what you could have done better if you had more time. All of these things actually create a lot of impact. Uh, discuss about technical limitations. So while actually designing a case study, if it is a hypothetical case study, we actually don't think of uh, how this would be implemented. We just uh, go in the flow. We just uh, think about... Uh, all the ideas that are coming to our mind uh, without consulting the person who would be developing it. But in the industry, it doesn't happen like that. So in the industry, you have to be co in constant touch with the technical team who would be working on it. So uh, if you are aiming for a product design role, then you should also add some technical limitation. You should think of it uh, around your, like by yourself only that, okay, I feel this could be a problem later, but uh, this could be an alternative solution to this. So yeah, something like this, again, the business scope of it. So for example, if uh, any particular feature is being added in any of the existing products, then what business impact it could bring out, okay? So for example, if you're adding polls on Zoom, then it might open up another platform uh, or another, I mean, it might open up a new uh, horizon for the other people who actually require polls in their webinars or lecturers and who might be using some other platforms so this might indirectly impact the business scope uh then add links to your other project projects so basically uh if you are hosting it on some other website like medium or something they have this integration already but uh if you are hosting it on your own website it don't uh like put it to a dead end always add another uh it should be in continuation so for example if you have hooked the a recruiter or the user whoever is looking at your portfolio or the case study if you have already hooked them then and if they actually liked it they would want to see more of it so provide them an option to view another profile uh, or uh, view other project okay next point is if you reject any of the uh, solution or the ideas mention the reason that why did you do so um what was the reason behind rejecting this particular thing and going with the other alternative method so again this creates a lot of impact and it gives an understanding uh to the recruiter that you are aware about what to reject and what to accept. <clears throat> also, uh, discuss your extra ideas. So you might get a lot of ideas while you'll be ideating. So, and you might not uh, be able to cover all of them. So you can add it in the end that I had these ideas, but uh, uh, due to time constraints and everything, I was not able to implement it. Then uh, add the summary in the beginning. Um, I think I should have written this point upwards, but yeah. Add the summary in the beginning uh, so that a person can go through it, what the whole project's, the project is all about and get a gist out of it. It can be uh, along with the screens that I mentioned that uh, we need to put it uh, in the first section. So, yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> moving ahead. Um, I've seen this in a lot of portfolios and I, I think a lot of you must be doing this. 
this is a big 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 no so don't don't do this in your case studies um this is a generalized defined process uh don't just copy paste it and just put it in your case studies because uh it is very different for each of the problem statement that um do we need to follow all of these things or not uh for example it shows empathize your now you empathized but how did you do that you defined the problem statement how did you do that you ideated what all you did for ideation i am interested to know more about it not just that you ideated but what you did so avoid this process if you want to add this then add what you did not this uh, uh, like uh, pre built framework so this is a big no uh, try to avoid it in your case studies and be very original of what you are doing okay um coming to the last segment which is acing your interviews this will have multiple sections around assignments whiteboarding and what to ask your recruiter so let's um it started i'll first cover of what actually recruiters look out for when you actually apply for that particular role so how do they analyze the profile and what do they look out for so first thing is for a lot of companies okay all of these are star marked uh, this doesn't apply for each and every company but for a lot of companies degree doesn't matter it um, doesn't require that uh, you need to have a formal design education if you have a nice portfolio if you have a prior experience which uh, defines your work which defines uh, that you are uh, qualified for that particular role it doesn't matter uh, whatever background you have then uh, the next point is stability in your past roles so a lot of freshers actually i've seen this in a lot of resumes that uh, they they join a company and uh, when they are actually applying for the other company there's just a gap of like 8 9 months this is not a very good sign initially until unless you have a very very strong reason so uh, while actually uh, you will be applying uh, and some people actually might will ask you that what is the reason for your switch some people might not even ask you because uh, you haven't completed uh, like a lot of time in your current organization it shows lack of trust and you might do the same with the current, or like with the with our organization if we are hiring for you. so stability is uh, like you should have a good stability in your past role yeah again unless and until the company is not uh, like up to the mark or any, any there are any other issues uh the other thing is responsibilities in your past role so this is something that you need to define very very properly in your resume so for example if you are leading a team you need to define that in your resume what were your responsibilities like if you uh, were creating an app what all uh, things that you did in uh, creating that app what was your contribution so that should be very very specific in your resume because while going through the resume i will check out that do you have that prior experience which i require so that is something we look out for uh, next thing is evolution of design so uh, at times when there are a lot of projects i would uh, go to the first project that was created let's say uh, the portfolio covers almost 3 years of a designer's journey i would want to go to the first project and compare it a little bit with the latest one so i would see a lot of um, evolution if i'm able to see a lot of evolution then it's a good sign that the person is willing to learn they are able to evolve so uh, like i'm i might feel the first case study is not very up to the mark so don't ever actually delete your uh, old case studies uh, from your portfolio because this is also one of the parameters that we uh, evaluate on that how uh, much able are you go grow uh, able to grow in the years and then again the case study is what is the quality of the case study what are the type of problem statements for example if uh, someone is actually taking up any generic problem statement versus a person uh, who has taken up a problem statement on their own um i might prefer to go with the person who has taken up uh, a problem statement on their own uh like stating the fact that both people have designed uh, the case study in a similar manner and their solutions are top notch so yeah uh, case studies also uh, they are basically the most important evaluation parameters then your previous performance so some of your companies might reach out to your uh, companies to get a feedback that how you have been performing there they might uh, everyone is connected to uh, each other in the design community so they might get their feedbacks from the other uh, designers as well uh who might be related to you then some might check the portfolio first and some might go for resume at times people might not be very bothered about the resume because it mostly covers uh, about your education where you have done from and your previous roles they might uh, generally go for like directly the portfolio how what all things you have done in your portfolio 
so it could be either of the ways so both of these should be very very in sync and they should uh, like have the best impression whatever the uh, like the recruiter is looking out for uh, at first so yeah let's go ahead uh, i'll cover about the interview process this is this could vary totally vary from company to company i'm just i just uh, put out the general interview process so you might first get the hr call by, uh, once you have applied they might uh, have some context setting they might ask you about your expectations around ctc compensation etc and then they might set up another call with uh, some of the designers who would uh, brief you about uh, what the uh, like what would be the other steps of interview and etc they would also tell you about the roles and expectations uh, they might ask you to walk them through your case study so you might prepare another set of uh, case study which is detailed because in at this particular point you, you need to explain them everything in detail then on the basis of that some companies might share an assignment some companies might go for white voting that totally depends on company to company after the assignment also there could be an assignment discussion round and then followed by a white boarding round or there could be a directly a white boarding round or even after the uh, assignment there could be an assignment discussion followed by the cultural fit round so cultural fit round is mostly taken by the other designers the other stakeholders like pro product managers or someone like that and then once everything is done once everything is decided then you might get a call from the hr again to do all the formalities discuss the compensation etc and uh, so this is the general interview process then uh, how to approach the assignments so that is the first part uh if you are given an assignment a lot of companies are moving away from the assignment bit because um both of the persons do not equally invest in assignment actually it's just the um basically the candidate who is actually investing in the assignments but uh, uh if we are receiving a lot of application then this might be one of the approaches for the recruiting team to go for it then uh, coming to the design assignments okay first thing is uh, read the brief very very carefully just understand what the person is asking for what all things you need to complete what all things you need to do so understand the brief very very uh, properly do not jump onto solutions directly analyze the problem analyze why the problem exists what you have have to design for what solutions have to, you to do and then go for the ideations of the solutions do not start with these solutions directly even while reading don't think of solutions you'll always be stuck at some particular point of time then understand the role basically what you are applying for for example if you're applying for a ui role then you might you will be judged on the ui skills a lot obviously you'll be judged on the other skills as well like how well is your ux and how well is your product thinking and everything but you will be majorly judged on the ui so try to cover like 80 percent of your part uh in terms of visual part i mean why you are using uh, some particular elements why you are using the xyz colors there so uh, understand the role and uh, ask the recruiter that what will be the parameters at times it is written in the assignment also if not written try to ask them that why it will be uh, on what basis you will be judged um another part is compile everything in one doc so you might be working in multiple uh, on multiple products for example you might be designing wireframes in figma you might be doing the compiling the user research in notion or google docs or somewhere else so compile one doc add all the links there because at times there are a lot of times when this happens uh when the person who is evaluating they miss out on a lot of things so once uh, and mention that there are four or five xyz number of attachments attached with this particular file so that they don't miss out on anything if a, if the company has provided a branding if there if that is the subset of their own product try to follow their branding try to understand their branding and try to follow it if it is a completely uh, like uh, out of the scope product i mean uh, it doesn't relate with the existing company then you have to think of your own branding what kind of colors you'll be using in the product and you have to provide the reasoning for it as well that why you have selected this particular set of colors fonts etc so you have to cover the visual aspect of it as well uh another thing is utilize your time wisely don't start building everything from scratch there are a lot of resources available it's not uh, bad to use those resources mention you can also mention that you have taken these resources you have not designed on this own uh, basically through the assignments you are trying your able uh, your ability to uh, how do you use the resources also and how do you do it in a particular given set of time obviously if you'll be joining a company you might need to create all of these things from scratch there might be libraries that would be existing and then you can actually uh, go through it 
uh then yeah your documentation should be very um, uh, strongly and nicely narrated uh, if a person is actually reading it it should be like you talking through that doc because you're not able uh, you're not there to explain the whole thing in person so this is something uh, about the design assignments let's uh, quickly cover on uh, the whiteboarding rounds um so first i'll uh, tell you what the whiteboarding rounds are and what are they for so basically you will be given a problem statement on spot these are actually conducted to understand your critical thinking abilities on spot if you are giving any problem how quickly are you able to understand the problem and evaluate the problem uh we can we also analyze that uh, how you are able to perform under time constraints and under pressure because uh, there's a very limited time like uh, one hour two hour three hours so and uh how are your collaboration skills because there are uh there might be uh like two people from the team or just one people from one person for the team and how you're actually collaborating with them uh is also what we analyze on uh then how do you approach the problem are you directly jumping onto the solution what is the process that you're following all of that we analyze on so let's check out that uh, what you should do and what you should avoid uh, in the whiteboarding round uh, a lot of times uh, with a lot of freshers uh, like a lot of people are not very well versed with this particular uh, ex exercise or activity so tell them in advance that you, it, it, this is your first time so that the other person knows that okay you might feel face some issues and they'll be they'll be helping you out okay ensure that you have a good connectivity if you're not in a good connectivity tell them in advance and reschedule it because it's very bad experience uh, that your net is hampering in between and uh, half of the time they'll not be able to understand what you're saying and vice versa so if you are not in a good connectivity it's better to reschedule um have a rough structure ready by your side uh it's you you don't need to blindly follow it because you don't know what kind of problem statement you're getting but you can at least have pointers that i need to cover all of these things in my uh, time given and I uh, so that you don't miss out on any other things then uh, ask the medium also before uh, uh, or when you get the information about the whiteboarding round so ask the medium where is it going to be hosted is it going to be hosted on FigJam, Miro whatever the platform is get very well versed with that software if they ask you to use any of those softwares of your own choice go for the one which you are uh, very very well versed with don't uh, like think of what the other person will think if I'm not using Figma, if I'm using XD, go with the one that you're very comfortable with. Uh, always keep a timer on your screen. A lot of uh, tools nowadays like Miro, FigJam, Fig they have uh, a timer. If you are using any other tool which doesn't have a timer, keep a stopwatch. Divide your time wisely that, okay, in the first 10 minutes, I'm going to do this. First 10, I'm going to do this. And understand that uh, the requirement basically. Ask the uh, interviewer that what do I actually ultimately need to deliver? And then uh, define the whole process. Don't directly jump onto the solution. Take five minutes to analyze the problem. Take five minutes uh, to understand what all process you'll be going through. Uh, prepare yourself and then start with it. Okay. So uh under yeah i've already covered this understand the final expectation uh take the ownership of the task and drive it on your own so don't think of it uh that okay they have only given me this information take the ownership like uh if they have not given any particular information if you think you can do something better ask them uh, ask them if uh, you want to um, create like a web product or a mobile product so just ask them a lot of questions keep it collaborative the more you ask uh, questions it should not be very very vague questions though but uh, the question should also be uh, making sense uh, so yeah the more you ask questions the better it is and uh, don't ask open questions okay for example uh, let's say if you want to um, understand okay what is the tg so instead of asking is it uh, for uh, male or female uh, just ask them what is the target audience so if you ask them is it, is it for male or female you will get the answer either male or female so you are limiting your scope over here but if you are asking what is the tg they might explain you okay it is for females who are of this 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 particular age from this 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 region so keep open-ended questions um don't panic if the uh, interviewer is asking questions in between there could be multiple things uh, they can ask you in between or at the end so uh don't don't panic at all um they might try to give some hints they might try to confuse you in between uh so take the hints what uh, if they're asking any questions if they're repeating uh, questions and asking you again try to get those hints uh always converse in your comfortable language uh normally we use the english so if you're not very comfortable in english and if the other person knows hindi uh ask them if they are comfortable in hindi and try uh, go ahead with it. 
and then practice. So uh, before your whiteboarding round, take a uh, mock interview session with any of your friends or any of the other designers or anyone and practice. So yes, that's all about whiteboarding. Um, I'll quickly cover what all to consider uh, while accepting the offer letter. So these are the few things that you actually need to keep in mind. Um, sometimes the compensation would be really great, but uh, you might miss out on all of these other parameters. So I'll maybe share the slide and you might need to actually go through this uh, on your own. Uh, like you need to do a well research, uh, well, uh, background research of the culture that is there, how the work-life balance is, because even if they they are like giving a better compensation, but there's no work-life balance, no scope of growth, the team isn't great, then it might not be very good for you in your initial years of your career. So yeah, it totally depends on which state you are and what are your future goals on the basis of that. Select the ideal opportunity for you and go ahead with that. Uh, Another is, uh, which we actually miss out on is the perks. So sometimes the compensation is less, but the other perks are more. For example, if you are given a job in a uh, metro city and the compensation is comparatively higher than you're given a remote job, uh, there might be like, if you actually calculate the expenses, it might be actually uh, that you would be earning lesser in the metro city, even though the compensation is less, but because of the expenditures that you have. So to, like analyze all of these things very, very wisely. Uh, there are other perks like ESOPs, Mediclaims, uh, other uh, allowances. So just analyze all of these things and then go ahead with uh, making your final call. Uh, okay, so we have covered resume, portfolio, and the interview techniques. Um, uh, one thing which is left uh, is uh, interview your interviewer. So it's not one way thing. It's basically it's a two way conversation. It's not like uh, if I'm interviewing you. Uh, I'll be only asking questions. You are also expected to ask questions to me. And this is also one of the evaluation parameters on what questions do you ask? So let's uh, get on to it. Ask a lot of questions, but yeah, don't ask very, very vague questions and it should be very meaningful, whatever you ask. Uh, going ahead, uh, do not directly jump onto the conversation. Like if you're having a, a conversation with the recruiter or the designer or anyone, so do not like directly ask them what is the compensation that you'll offer. First, try to understand the roles and responsibilities in detail because it might justify the compensation. And uh, if you would hear the compensation later, it might basically make sense that why are they offering that much uh, according to industry standards or whatever. So understand the roles and responsibility first in detail and then uh, go for asking the uh, compensation and the other perks. Okay, uh, always ask about the vision and long term goals of the company because uh, you should not join a company which is not which do not have a goal plan for themselves, because you won't see your growth uh, there. Uh, you should understand uh, what the company is aiming for and if it is aligning with your own goals or not. So try to understand it. Also discuss about the financial stability of the companies. Oh, uh, in the coming years, the recession is approaching a bit. So if you're joining a company which is not financially stable, uh, you don't have the stability as well. Like they might fire you in, at any point of time. And so uh, discuss about it. Like where are they doing? What are the losses they're facing? Are they, are, is the company profitable or not? So uh, discuss all of these things. Then ask about all the rounds in advance that what all rounds will take place. So uh, discuss all about it in advance so that you're well prepared that this particular interview will take it around five or six rounds and you know where to invest your time. Then discuss about your expectations in terms of role and as well as compensation and what are the other perks like work from home policies, medical insurances, ESOPs, uh, other allowances like travel, food, all of those things. So just uh, discuss all of these things and then make a call. So yeah. Uh, that's all from my end. It was a long, long, long monologue. Now I'll open the stage for your questions. And uh, if the team, uh, like the pro team wants to take over. Yeah. So. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you should first have some water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I uh, think I'll be, I'll be giving you that uh, time. Uh, so uh, before, thank you so much. This was, I think, uh, Hiring 101 of each and everything. You have actually mentioned the do's and don'ts and what we do, what we don't do. Like some of the things I actually do while, while I, you know, scan the interviews, while adding someone to my team. Uh, I would be like going through it. And the one point you mentioned, comparing the growth and the progress. Because sometimes people say that remove your role portfolio. Mm -hmm. Do not add so much of case study. But you should have your first case first two 
maybe the case study is always there to be able uh, like to be able for us to evaluate it yeah. better right how much you have grown what all you have learned i think uh, i was able to relate to it so much but from the other side of it yeah so before we move to the q and a section i'll just make a quick announcement that um, i'll share a quick link in the chat section and we this is the final final workshop where we are running the 95% discount on the lifetime premium of pro app the prices are already uh, increased on the app for that particular for the lifetime premium so just for the workshop fam this is the link that is there you can use the coupon code and if you are already a yearly premium member you can reach out to support at the rate pro app or design and we would be happy to uh upgrade you at the prorated cost uh yeah if you have any further issues just email us and we'll be there cool so i think let's enter into the q and a round okay the first question uh pishti which was there was a very big question and it was also out of the uh, the indian uh, domain of design and hiring so clays uh if someone who lives in usa the, uh, so it, it is actually from someone who lives in greece mm -hmm. uh, the question is from christina so if someone someone lives in usa does not have the same opportunities oh, with yeah. someone living in greece where christina uh, lives it's easy to say that you can get hired in a good company and actually do a ux designer job uh, but in most cases even in big agency there is no ux designer role they mostly do ui design with some practices of ux design because companies don't want to invest in research mm -hmm. this is actually the norm across many european countries uh not just here in greece do you have any suggestions how to get a real ux design job okay so yeah i'll take that up so uh i agree that uh, if i compare it with the scenario two years back also here in india and all over the world i feel that uh, awareness for design is evolving uh when i was uh, actually going for my formal education in design uh, there was nothing existing like product design or ui ux design so now actually companies are actually uh, realizing the importance how design can uh, what changes or what impact design can bring to their businesses and now they are starting hiring for designers uh, obviously uh, even in the recession i would say the uh, it won't be a recession for uh, people who bring out quality and mm -hmm. who bring out uh, impact to the company so you need not to worry if you are uh, if you have the quality in you so uh, and uh, for the ui thing uh, that the service company she mentioned so uh, that is what i actually mentioned about the service company so a lot of work would actually come from their own company as well like they might have researchers on their own who might not be a part of the design team but in general like a strategy team or something they might be doing a common research and then they'll be sharing the analysis with you so, uh, you can use those analysis to build out the ui as you mentioned so mm -hmm. but yeah this uh, totally depends on company to company and this has been evolving in all of the uh, nations i would say so uh, even the european countries also they are evolving a lot and there are a lot of opportunities available out there and now after covid also uh, there are a lot of remote opportunities available as well so previously there were a lot of visa issues and everything but now you can actually sit uh, for example if you are from europe you can actually apply in asia and other continents or other nations as well uh, for remote jobs so yes i hope that answers your question let's take the other one what about if we don't have much industry experience what do you put on your resume okay so uh, it's not uh, always necessary that you will always have the industry experience for example if you are just a college graduate if you are starting out then uh, if you have done some similar activities in your college maybe you put it out that don't put it as your experience just add it under a section like a volunteer or something and it's not mandatory to have an industry experience uh, it is uh, but if your portfolio speaks for uh, i mean the kind of case studies that you put in so definitely you can uh, because we if you would be going through the resume we will be checking out that okay you have graduated in the recent years or uh, let's say if you were working as a software developer and now you're transitioning so uh, but your case uh, basically your portfolio should be able to balance that okay if empathy mappings are done 
uh, to empathize then how do i mention about how the user feels and what the user does about the product okay so i think this is uh, muthi is talking especially about uh, i mentioned that we should not follow the framework exactly. so i uh, basically Basically, I meant was that define what you're done in uh, empathy. So if you're done the empathy mapping, what is the process you followed? You might have went out to the users, talk to them or understand them, or you might have done your own hypothesis around it, or you might have read some research papers around it and then took the conclusion. So whatever was done, like just mention it. What is the process that you followed? I would want to understand that instead of just understanding that you have gone through a process called empathy mapping. Yeah, right. So, Makes sense. Okay, is age a problem when you want to switch to UX design? I can definitely know. Do companies give a hard time or eliminate people who are over thirty? Uh, I want to switch my job, but I have worries about this because I don't have any job experience in this area. So, uh, age doesn't matter. Actually, I have been receiving a lot of applications. Uh, who? are like uh, very very old than me uh, doesn't matter at all uh, like if you're able to understand the process how ux works how to build products uh, just start creating case studies of your own it's never too late to learn anything so uh, whenever you are interested in the field just uh, try to connect with more people through uh, for, from that field uh, try working on the case studies and you uh, while working on the case studies also you will analyze that if you are actually interested in that uh, field or not and then you can actually apply and people will actually uh, look out for your portfolio and then uh, try to figure out some good companies but don't uh, look out for background like this so there are a lot of startups and other companies also which don't have this bar that you need to have a formal education in design or all of these yeah. things so try to figure out, I mean, the one that I mentioned and shortlisting your company. So th that should be a first step, actually, uh, which companies will be able to accept you. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can we do a quick review session of resume and portfolio website? Okay. I think that would be uh, another <laughs> session because uh, we are running short of time. Right. But uh, definitely we can ask the program team to uh, connect. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yes, 100%. Okay, it's again from Christina. Behance is all about the visual stuff, not suitable for a UX design portfolio, where you have to showcase your way of thinking throughout a project, all the research that you have done, all the problems that you faced, and how you reached to the suggestions you did. Also, ha you have to write about the findings of each case study. So uh, I totally don't agree here uh, on this particular part because you can, uh, there are a lot of things available on Behance <clears> and you can put a whole PDF also there. You can write a lot of stuff. So it's, uh, that's totally depending on you that if you just add the visual stuff or uh, as you, you have already mentioned the whole process. So you can uh, just write down the whole process and uh, um, like basically uh, add parts from your research, add what you have done, all the problems that you faced. Uh, why I mentioned Behance was the discoverability is easier. It's great right. to have your own portfolio website. It's great to host it on uh, Medium also. But discoverability wise, Behance, Medium, all of these platforms where I can go and search for, let's say if I just uh, randomly type the keyword called design, product design, I'll be able to see people who are related to it. So for that, it's good. And it totally depends on you how you create the whole case study. And also, I think from the recruiters, and we are also uh, used to go and search on Behance or Dribble as the first thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, exactly. um, when we say that, don't break the common stuff sometimes in terms of design also, right? Don't uh, all yeah. the perceived user behavior. You wouldn't yeah. want to uh, make the payment button on the left-hand side that yeah. you would always want it in the middle. So I think that's the same thing in terms of uh, the resume as well. Okay, can you please share the slides? Yeah, definitely we'll do that in the form of recording. What are the best websites to look for product design roles? Okay, um, I think uh, there are a lot of websites available. LinkedIn is the most common, I would say. Uh, there are a lot of other, I mean, if you're specifically aiming for startups, um, AngelCo and all of these websites also provide great insights. You can also check out on Glossdoor also now they have started putting out um. We can right. see yeah. there are a lot of uh, other websites, indeed, uh, hiring all of these things are also available. So figure out uh, if you're what if you want to apply for startups. So angel.co, I know of it uh, as like which uh, I mean, it's it's available globally and people from all over the world post uh, over there, but it's mainly for startups. So if you're looking out for startups, do check out that else you can uh, look out on LinkedIn and other platforms as well. Indeed, hiring all of those things. 
I think they recently rebranded themselves as Well Found. Okay. Oh, uh, not not aware. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think Take well note found of that. <laughs> okay. What a uh, uh, what type of work experiences do recruiters look uh, like to see on resumes? So, uh, again, that depends on the kind of role that you're applying for. So, let's say if I'm applying for a product designer role, if I am from a graphic design background, it might be a little disconnect for the role. But if my portfolio defines it, my case study justifies all of that, it's totally good. Uh, so, WorkX, uh, it, like that totally depends on what WorkX you have, but how you define it, even if uh, you have been in some other role, but if you know how to work in teams, if you know how to bring out uh, uh, the impact through your projects and everything, that is something we look out for through your resumes. So, okay. okay. Uh, as a product designer, how do you tackle whiteboarding session? I always have hesitation doing whiteboarding. So that's that's a very common thing because uh, we all might uh, be very, very hesitant because we don't know what's going to come up. So the more you practice, the better you will actually perform. So practice is the key, as I already mentioned. Uh, there are a lot of platforms where you can actually connect with the other designers, book sessions with them. Uh, so book uh, all of these sessions for my uh, mock interviews. You can ask any of your friends also to give you a problem statement. They might not be able to evaluate on the basis of it, but at least you'll practice in the given constraint of time if you're not able to connect with any of the designers or um, any other people. So that is one way. Uh, another is to look out, uh, like there would be a lot of mock videos available on YouTube and uh, there would be a lot of articles. So go through them, read them, you'll get some more confidence than how to approach it. So if you have a very, very set pattern of approaching a problem, uh, not asking you to follow a very typical framework, but uh, let's say in first 10 minutes, you have to reach at least this point of time. I mean, this step, then in next 10 minutes, you have to achieve this. So if you are following that pattern, then automatically you'll be able to cover all the steps and you'll be able to close the uh, total round in the given amount of time how do you present the work that you have done in your previous company okay so there might be a lot of limitations over here because a lot of companies might have the nda and you might not be allowed to share the work that is uh that you have done on the uh so just add uh, like the best uh, approach to this would be just add uh, like a tile or maybe like a very, very short project in your portfolio in your case study and mention that this is under NDA. Contact me. I'll uh, give you a walkthrough. Uh, this has happened with me a lot of times that in the uh, like the portfolio that they present, it's very old and uh, the case studies are very old. They don't normally when you're working in a full time job, you don't get a lot of time to work on case studies and everything because you're uh, you have a lot of work, but again, you can't add it in your portfolio. So that is one thing which you can actually mention to in your first call also to the recruiter that I have a lot of work apart from the ones in my portfolio. I might be only able to uh, share it with you like I'm uh, over a call or somewhere because I can't publish it. So that is something which you can do. A lot of uh, if you have a personal website, you can actually ask for the contact details and then you can provide access to uh, some part of it. Maybe you can hide some numbers mm -hmm. because... Uh, that is something which is confidential. Uh, so you can uh, actually take permission from the company that you want to share any data related things with them. But uh, in general, the process and everything that you followed, that is another approach that you can follow. Okay. Uh, uh, I think it uh, it's an extension to the previous question only. Mm -hmm. The problem statement which we worked in past company as a case study to the interviewer some of the designs may not have gone live and mm -hmm. some screens, how do I go about it? Yeah. So again, that is the same answer to mm -hmm. that as well. It's not live. So you can just mention that uh, currently in process, reach out mm -hmm. to me on my mail or uh, I'll give you a walkthrough of this through on a video call. I'll share my screen, all of that. So that is one approach that you can follow. Uh, okay. What scalar looks in candidate? Uh, when they hire, just asking out of curiosity. <laughs> okay, so one thing that we definitely look out for is the uh, zeal to grow. I mean, no one is perfect. Uh, also, in the whole scenario, I mean, in the whole webinar, I have not talked about softwares at all because for me and for a lot of companies, that's the least important thing because it's not 
uh, a big task to learn softwares. I mean, you can learn that in a week or something. Uh, the major soft skills that uh, are required, I have mostly talked about it. So Scalar also, we look out for that. Uh, I mean, uh, and that totally depends on what kind of role are you applying. If you're applying for a fresh level role, then we would want to uh, have a person who is uh, accepting to feedback I mean uh, who is able to grow through feedbacks who is willing to learn even though they don't have a lot of experience in previous work or I mean they don't have like very very great case studies but if they're able to improve then definitely it would be a good hire if they're able to understand uh, points I mean through uh, like if we are in a whiteboarding session if I'm giving some hints if they're able to grab them if they're able to understand it so definitely that is something which would actually make an impact should be asked for reference as a fresher if yes then how to approach okay so yeah you can definitely ask for a reference as a fresher uh before uh reaching out to any person on linkedin or on email give a very very small uh background of yourself and why that person should basically refer you or uh give your reference in your team uh do not uh reach out to multiple people in the team this i've seen a lot so like when we are actually discussing in, in our team so the same person reaches out to all mm -hmm. the people that is fine but like uh, take some time if the other person is not responding if you don't get a response from them like uh, in two days then only reach out to the other person don't bombard each and everyone in the team with uh messages so that is something which uh you can be considerate of so is certification one of the parameter during shortlist Okay, so if you're talking about uh, design courses certification, uh, no, because uh, personally, like I evaluate more on case studies at like some companies might look out for uh, uh, people who have formal design degrees. So uh, they have another reasons for that. Uh, for example, if any startup is looking out for that, so they would want to build a team who would have a pedigree nice pedigree because when they go for funding when they go for these rounds then they have to basically show that what kind of team they have i mean what is the background and everything so certification doesn't matter especially the very very short ones uh mm. it also i mean it's the same amount of uh, content that is being delivered to each and every one so um certification in my opinion doesn't matter a lot even though uh to a lot of extent degrees also do not matter Okay, I think it's the same question. How do people feel about uh, things like Google UX design certificate? When you do certificate? So, uh, like, uh, normally, if I talk about myself, I don't look out for these. I mean, it's okay that you've done a particular course. You you might have uh, uh, got some information around it. But totally depends on how you implement it in your case studies and what are you following. But yeah, uh, a lot of, uh, this is something which I uh, should mention out. So, I've seen a lot of people. Uh, like I can figure out basically through their case study if, if they have taken Google course or Udemy course because they follow a same pattern in the case study. Like whatever Google teaches you, it is for your reference. I mean, they tell you that, okay, you can fill in these blanks and you can create a case study out of it. That doesn't mean you have to put it in your case study. That's for your practice. You should grab it and then you should apply it on your own. So that is something you need to take care of. I think uh, the only thing should we add our certificates in our resume? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's a good yeah. to add. I mean, you uh, and if it is especially relevant to the role that you're playing, it's definitely good to add. Uh, that also also sh uh, shows a zeal that okay, you are continuously learning something. Right. Yeah, I think I have wanted to add that only, especially when you have a gap year or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and when you're transitioning they, from the other role, for example, right, so, from commerce background to product design or any any other role, so, yeah. that that adds that value to the yeah uh, to your resume okay one last question from me just uh, uh what is what was your design journey like like i'm really okay. excited <laughs> so uh i actually started with the and then i dropped out in my first year and then i was not very sure of what to do in design i mean i wanted to get into a creative field because i had that problem solving thing uh entrepreneurship thing from the very beginning so i wanted to be in some field which uh, is strategical and all of it but I did not know what and where I just know I did not want to go for fashion designing so <laughs> there was something called like, uh, communication design communication. Uh, NIFT uh, which actually uh, looked good to me uh, it had uh, photography it had a lot of other things which I was interested in I just joined it 
uh i would say from the very first year i started with internships i mean there were a lot of subjects actually in my uh, specific course um uh, mm -hmm. there was content writing uh, marketing and then visual merchandising photography graphic design a lot of things so since there were a lot of things i was also confused that what to pursue finally so i think i did internships in almost each and every sector to figure out which interests me and so that i'm very clear till the end of my final year that what i want to pursue so graphic design was something which i was very very interested in and which i followed for almost 3 uh, years uh, i did a lot of freelance work i really enjoyed it um i did my first internship in also graphic designing as an art director so that was my first mnc experience rest i was doing all remote so there i realized i mean it was good everything was nice people were also nice company was nice the work was nice it was creative but uh, like personally for me i felt that i was not creating out any impact uh, as in in okay. for people actually i wanted to do something which impacts people uh build something which impacts people so that is where i looked out for other opportunities and that's where i got to know about ui ux and then i started reading about it so the first case study that i actually have um, i actually looked out for a problem <laughs> myself in my college which was the leave application so we had to fill in as, as in the physical applications for leave every time so i just thought of automating it and uh, like i analyzed how much time it would save for each of these stakeholders i mean my director my hod my warden all of these people and just provided a very simple solution the problem existed around me i just converted it into a solution as an app so that is something where i started from and when i was actually doing it it was um very very a uh, great experience i mean i enjoyed it a lot and that's where i applied for my first ux internship and then uh yeah yeah i think that's the answer to almost all the questions that were asked today like how do you get that first job and how do you uh, you know if you do not have any prior experience or a formal degree mm -hmm. so okay one last question there yeah. in the round uh, if i have a lot of mock projects and less real life projects with other people can that hurt me <laughs> okay so if you're going for senior uh, level roles it might uh, for for the very fresher roles for the very very niche roles uh, definitely it might not but mm -hmm. yeah if you're going for uh, like let's say if the role requires almost 3 to 4 years of experience and you do not have any real life projects it might create a bad impact that uh, okay you have an understanding of how to apply all of these skills or to a project but you don't have a uh, an experience in actually implementing these and how does it work in the industry and in real life because when you actually design for a case study a hypothetical case study it's comparatively a little different from when you actually apply it in real life there are a lot of uh, limitations there are a lot of other things that come into factor technicalities business goals all of those so if you are applying for a senior role then you might be expected that you know all of these things so in that case it might be a backdrop cool i think we have answered almost everything that was there and uh, you know after so many weeks there were around 100 people in the workshop today we just <laughs> spoke to about 100 people and made an impact on you know 100 to be designers or maybe someone who is trying to start to transition so glad for that thank you thank you so much for that and uh, this was a really really great session um, i think we should do it again sometime definitely uh, definitely i'll be up for it <laughs> Okay. Cool. So I just added a uh, a Pushti's LinkedIn profile. You can yeah, connect you can, with her. Yeah, that's really fair. Reach out to her later. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. So Have a great weekend. Bye bye.